Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining uh, this morning. I know you all had a, uh, an exam yesterday in this class, and probably, I assume, you've had midterms uh, in other class. So I appreciate you making time uh, this morning. Uh, I'll probably wait just a few more minutes um, before we get started. I've already got the recording going, um, but it looks like there are still a few people joining. So we can just wait a moment, uh, and then uh, we'll get started in uh, get started for sure. Okay, it looks like our numbers have kind of stabilized a bit. So uh, why don't we get started? Um, obviously, you know, I'm sure people will, uh, maybe a few will join uh, as we go, but that's okay. We're recording it. So uh, you can drop in or drop out uh, however you like. So I hope everything's going well for you. Um, we're reaching sort of the, so we're in the final section uh, of this course uh, where we've moved from sort of the low level stuff that we talked about at the very beginning. Um, Things like, uh, you know, the way the brain is organized, sensation and perception, uh, attention. Then we moved into sort of knowledge representations, the structured representations of things uh, in the mind, uh, like memory and concepts, uh, short-term memory and long-term memory, all the stuff you've uh, just finished uh, working on if you uh, took the exam in this class. Now we're going to sort of head into the final section, uh, which is where we're sort of, we're going to talk about what we would refer to as higher order cognition. Uh, and I've also included language uh, in this section because that's the order that it uh, occurs in the textbook. So we're going to talk about problem solving, decision making, thinking and reasoning and language. Uh, there are two chapters in the textbook which we won't uh, cover in class uh, and I'm not covering on the exam uh, coming up and that's the section on expertise. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on that but I won't be asking you to read that chapter. It's not one of the assignments. Uh, and the chapter on individual differences. Uh, so those two chapters uh, are in the text, but I'm not including them uh, in the syllabus. So you won't see any assignments uh, to read them and I won't have any exam questions from them uh, in the final exam coming up. So I'm gonna get started uh, with a uh, screen share and then we'll get into the lecture material. Uh, I've tried to keep this a little bit short, uh, so I don't think we'll be going as long uh, as some of the previous lectures, but we'll see. I always say that, uh, and it always turns out to be wrong. I'm a very bad uh, judge of how long it takes me to get through things uh, on a lecture like this. Uh, it doesn't seem to be able to do a little bit better when we're doing an in-person lecture, but uh, we'll do what we can. Um, okay, so let me share. I'm uh, going to share the whole desktop, uh, and then I will... Uh, open up uh, my PowerPoint and we'll get started here. I'm going to highlight, uh, I'm going to get rid of all of the, um, okay, so you should just see my screen. Uh, these slides should be available on the um, OWL site. Uh, they're also available on the team site. Uh, midway through, when we talk about some problem solving examples, you're going to see that I deviate a little bit from what you've got. That's just because I've added in some extra step-by-step uh, -step, uh, solution for the hobbits and orcs problem. You've got the solution in your notes, um, but we're going to go through it in a little bit more detail, but I didn't, that would have meant adding in like 20 extra slides that literally almost all look the same, so it didn't seem very useful. Uh, so you won't have those. Uh, then there's one slide at the end where I think maybe I included a solution to something which you won't have also because we'll probably talk about it. Uh, so there might be one or two cases where you'll notice there's a slight deviation from what you have, uh, but it won't be a major deviation. Um, okay, so if you've got all that ready, uh, if you've got questions, by all means, uh, put them in the uh, chat window. Uh, I usually try to leave that open. Uh, let me just move that open, move that over here so that I can see it. I'm going to move my Zoom toolbox down to the bottom so I can't see it. Actually, maybe I'll move it at the top. Uh, okay, I think I'm ready to go. I hope you're all ready to go. You've got uh, got your coffee, your tea, or whatever. 
uh, and uh, let's get started. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, thinking uh, for the next three classes. Uh, in addition to the language uh, content at the very end, uh, we're going to talk about these topics which will collectively refer to as the psychology of thinking. Now, some of you were in my uh, third year course on the psychology of thinking, uh, and maybe some of you are interested in taking that uh, next year. Uh, if you are, we're going to talk about this psychology of thinking in a lot more detail if you've ever taken that course. But I, obviously, we need to talk about it now, too, because it's part of the uh, content of cognitive psychology. Cognition is the processing of information uh, with some goals in mind, and many of those goals are solving problems, uh, reasoning about things, uh, thinking about them and arriving at conclusions and making inductions and deductions, uh, and also making decisions. So all of the things that we want to do with the information that we have in our memories or the information that we have in our uh, concepts and categories, uh, we want to be able to accomplish goals. And these are the kind of goals that most people want to accomplish, right? We want to solve problems. Uh, we want to think about things. We want to arrive at conclusions. We want to know what's coming. We want to make predictions. Uh, we want to be able to predict the future. We want to be able to reduce uncertainty. And we want to be able to decide about things. So let's talk about problem solving. And this is a problem of searching through a problem space. We'll come back to this metaphor later. Um, but uh, uh, Newell and Simon defined problem solving and problem space in the early 1970s. So both of them were cognitive psychologists, uh, cognitive scientists, but also pioneers in artificial intelligence. Um, and one of the uh, goals uh, that both Newell and Simon uh, had when understanding problem solving was to try to figure out how to, uh, how to design a computational system that would solve problems in the same way that humans do. And so when you're trying to design an artificial intelligence uh, or design an algorithm uh, or design a series of algorithms that can uh, make decisions and solve problems, uh, one of the best ways to do that is to figure out how humans are doing it and then try to work backwards from that so that you can design the algorithm to solve problems in roughly the same way. And that's what Newell and Simon were interested in. Now, this is 1972. Um, of course, in 1972, artificial intelligence was uh, a much simpler uh, relative to what we you know, experience today in AI. It was a much simpler process. They were trying to figure out uh, the mechanisms by which uh, artificial intelligences could be defined. Uh, they coined the term artificial intelligence, and they sort of built the field of artificial intelligence. It's a field that we're a lot more familiar with now. Um, but in the 1970s, one of the goals was, how do we solve problems? How do we get computers to solve problems in the same way that uh, humans do? And one of the things that they realized was that when you were designing a computer simulation to solve problems, one thing you could do is to put all of the possible solutions and all of the possible moves that you would need to make, all of the possible steps you would need to take into one big array. Uh, and they would call this the problem space. So we'll come back to a definition of the problem space in a few slides. But problem space, uh, when you're solving a problem, is everything that you could possibly do, all of the steps you could take. Some of them might solve the problem. Some of them might solve the problem quickly. Others might be uh, false uh, starts. They might be uh, false paths, or they might be steps that would not lead to a solution, or steps that would lead to the wrong answer. All of these are contained within the problem space. Uh, the more complex the problem, the larger the space. Simple problems have a small space. Complex problems have a large space. Uh, and trying to navigate through that space and pick one of the solutions uh, takes more time for more complicated problems. So we'll come back to this metaphor of problem space, but that's uh, a good way to think about problem solving and thinking in general. Um, more broadly, we can define thinking as what we do when we're in doubt about how to act, what to believe, or what to desire. Uh, sometimes we're not in doubt. We know exactly what we want when you're, you know, you get up in the morning. Uh, you go through probably a series of script-like behaviors. Uh, you, maybe you uh, consult a schema uh, where you go through a series of actions without even really thinking very hard about it, right? So first thing I do when I get up in the morning uh, is I turn the coffee maker on, right? Because I want to have coffee as soon as I get up. Uh, then I deal with whatever the cat is asking for, usually food uh, in a food dish. Uh, and then there's a couple of other things that I might do, but I don't actually think about them. They're just sort of routine, right? That's procedural memory. 
Uh, that's implicit memory. Uh, but thinking is what we do when we're in doubt about what, to, uh, what predictions we want to make. So keep that in mind when we talk about problem solving, but also keep it in mind when we talk about reasoning, when we talk about deduct deductive thinking, inductive thinking, and when we talk about decision making. Um, another way to think about thinking is focused thinking versus unfocused thinking. Uh, what we're going to concern ourselves with in this class and in the next three classes uh, is uh, focused thinking. So trying to achieve goals or solve problems or make decisions. Uh, so it's when you deliberately try to do something and you use your concepts, your language, uh, your working memory, your short-term memory, your knowledge, all of those things together to try to accomplish some sort of a goal. Uh, now that uses a lot of the same mechanisms as what we can call unfocused thinking. And unfocused thinking is what we do when uh, there's some downtime, right? Daydreaming or uh, unintentional or even creative thinking to some extent, right? So when you're not trying to accomplish a goal, but you're just thinking about things, uh, that is an example of unfocused thinking. They both use knowledge structure. They both make um, uh, access, they, you know, they both access uh, your semantic network, and there's spreading activation involved in both cases. There's working memory involved in both cases, and there might be uh, mental imagery involved in both cases. Uh, but focused thinking has a goal, requires a little bit more effort. Unfocused thinking doesn't have a goal and may require less effort. So for today, we're going to talk about problem solving, which is an example of this focused thinking. Uh, and we'll talk about how you study solving problems, but Mostly we're gonna talk about how people actually solve problems. What are the mechanisms that uh, explain it? Uh, what are the cognitive processes that underlie problem solving? Uh, and the two, uh, the two main theories we'll talk about are the problem space approach, which relies on uh, using different kinds of algorithms and heuristics. Uh, and then we'll talk about the role of experience. So analogy and background experience and expertise in problem solving. So let's define what a problem is. A problem is a gap or a barrier between some current state and some goal state. So whatever you want to accomplish, uh, if you can't get there easily, uh, if there isn't an obvious way to uh, achieve some desired outcome, then what you have is a problem. Uh, you have a gap or a barrier. Uh, most of your academic work is probably described uh, this way, right? You start off at the beginning of a course, uh, you don't know exactly uh, how to obtain a good mark at the end. Uh, so there might be some gap or barrier in between there. Some of the gaps are pretty straightforward. They're uh, just getting through the information that you need uh, to take an exam. Uh, but there might be other things that are less clear. So this year, uh, when most of us had to adapt to online learning, uh, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the strategies we've used in the past to help solve problems like uh, how to keep up with your coursework and how to obtain a good mark in class just weren't there, right? So we didn't have a lot of those ready-made solutions. So the obstacle or the gap was a little bit bigger. Um, problems can be simple or complex. So withdrawing the money uh, from a bank. Uh, so if you ever need to get cash from a bank, which is not something most people need to do anymore. Um, I'm trying to think of the last time I actually went to a cash machine. Uh, I think I might literally have cash left in my wallet from like a year ago or something. I probably, when, uh, uh, when Ontario and London sort of went into a little bit of a lockdown back in March, 2020, I think I took out some cash. I don't know why, I probably just figured like the world's gonna end, gotta have a stack of cash or something. Uh, and I don't think I used any of it. So it's probably still sitting in my wallet, who knows? Because um, everybody just pays with their phone now, right? I mean, you can just pay with your phone or tap with a card or something. So uh, the need for cash is pretty small. Uh, I'm not really using it for anything. Uh, but you know how to get it, right? You just walk up, uh, put your card in, cash comes out. Easy. But investing money uh, is a much more complex problem. Both have to do with money. They both involve maybe a bank. Uh, maybe you're going to talk about uh, different kind of money market accounts or retirement accounts. It's a lot more complicated. In both cases, uh, you're, you're looking at the same outcome. You want to get money. One of them simple. The other one's a more complex problem. So we'll talk about these as being well-defined versus ill-defined. So let's visualize this. We've got an initial state. That's the unsolved problem. That's where you are now, right? That's with, uh, that's at the beginning of a class or at the beginning of a lecture or um, 
maybe at the beginning of uh, an exam is uh, an initial state, right? Or the beginning of any, uh, uh, you know, before you accomplish uh, whatever goal it is you want to accomplish, whether it's a, a fitness goal, a personal goal, or just a really simple goal of being able to cook something good for dinner. Uh, and the goal is what you want, whether it's a good meal or a good mark or uh, to earn money, whatever it is, that's your goal. And if there's something in between, an obstacle or a gap or no clear solution path, uh, that's the problem. So those are the three uh, steps. We've got an initial state, the obstacle state in the middle, uh, and then we've got the goal state at the end. Those are states, right? Um, but at each one of these, there are things that exert some uh, influence on those sections. Uh, so in the initial state, we're going to have uh, things around us that make it easier to solve the problem or more difficult. And we're going to call these givens. These are things that are uh, implied or explicitly implied, uh, implicitly uh, given to you, uh, information that helps you solve the problem or keeps you from solving the problem. So all of the things that are exerting an influence on the initial state are going to be called givens. Cat's asking to sit up on my lap again. Uh, cat is an obstacle. Um, so at the obstacle stage, um, what we have are the means. So the means are what you use in order to convert the initial state to the goal state and to overcome the obstacle. Givens are things that make it easier or harder, uh, but means are the things that you do, the steps that you take. Uh, so this might mean a uh, really straightforward thing. So for the example of Peppermint, my cat being a problem or an obstacle to a decent lecture, she's down here uh, sort of, you know, trying to get up on the chair. Um, the means that I use to solve the problem are just bend down and pick her up, right? I mean, that's a really simple, but there's other things I could do, right? I could open the door and kick her out or uh, I could just ignore her. Uh, all of these are different ways to solve the problem. So I choose different means uh, uh, to, uh, to achieve the goal. So givens affect the initial state, uh, means affect uh, the obstacles. Let's talk about these in more detail. I just explained them a little bit, but I also have them uh, on some slides so that uh, we can, to remind myself of some other things. So your initial states and your givens, these are objects, conditions, constraints that affect how you're gonna solve the problem. One of the examples I use uh, a lot when I talk about this, um, and I've used this example uh, in the book that I wrote, uh, are these sort of online food network, uh, not online, these food network um, games like Chopped or Guy's Gro Grocery Games or the uh, Cake Wars or any of these shows where people have to competitively do something, right? They all sort of have a similar format. You've probably watched these shows, even if you don't like them because they're always on. Um, and what they are, of course, is uh, at, at the beginning, there's an initial state, which is your competitor standing up there at sort of a studio kitchen, right? Uh, then they're, they're described a goal state where they're told to create something that's going to impress the judges. Uh, and then there's an obstacle, which is they have to create uh, this meal in a certain amount of time. But what they have as a given uh, are things like the ingredients that they are provided with. Uh, the cookware that they're provided with, the level of expertise that they already have, um, or the uh, particular expertise with a type of cooking. So if they say, uh, you know, the secret ingredient in this case is, uh, you know, Jerusalem artichokes or whatever. Uh, if nobody, if the, if the chef doesn't know what a Jerusalem artichoke is or doesn't work with them, uh, they're going to have a bigger problem, right? But if it's something that they've used in cooking before, then they have a smaller problem. Uh, and you can, if you ever watch these shows, um, it's a perfect example of this kind of problem solving because uh, what they do is uh, they actually run the show. I mean, I'm sure you've all watched them, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on this too much, but they run the show in a way that is similar to Newell and Simon's uh, under study of problem solving, where uh, people are given a problem, uh, they're provided with some givens, and then you ask people to talk you through uh, the act of solving the problem. Uh, Newell and Simon called this a think aloud protocol. But in most of these shows, what they do is uh, the, you know, the cook is, the chef is talking about what they're doing. Uh, and then sometimes they break away and they sort of reflect back on what they were doing and describe their thought process. Uh, and it's a, it's very much like this kind of problem solving approach where they have to figure out how to combine things in certain ways. 
Now, some of the goals or some of the uh, uh, givens are explicit in a condition like this. So the uh, cookware that you have is clearly right in front of you. Um, but other things like maybe your level of experience with something uh, might not be explicitly given to you, but it's something that you need to realize uh, as uh, you begin solving the problem. So the initial state is affected by these givens. Um, the obstacles can be any one of a number of different things. Uh, the most obvious one is that you just don't remember how to solve the problem. Uh, so uh, just as an example, you probably all have faced this. Suppose you discover how to do something in uh, you know, whatever stats program you're using. So many of you are in the, uh, uh, a lot of you are probably in the statistics course, right? Maybe you're using SPSS or you're using R or you're using uh, another stats program, uh, you probably figure out how to do a specific analysis, right? So you figure out how to run an analysis of variance, or you figure out how to run uh, a multiple regression. Uh, and that's a series of steps, right? So if you do it two or three times, you remember how to do it. Um, but if you haven't had to do it for, let's say a few months and you come back, uh, you, you enroll in the next level of stats course and they say, well, you know, start off with a multiple regression, you don't remember how to do it, right? You don't remember how to work the software. Uh, you don't remember some of the steps you need to take. So you just don't recall exactly how to solve it. So you've got to look up those steps again. That's a clear obstacle, right? If you remember how to solve it, it's not a problem. But if you haven't solved it enough times, maybe you don't have an immediate recall of what the solution should be. Uh, another, uh, you know, obviously obstacles are uh, present when there's no clear path when you just have never solved the problem before and you don't even know where to begin. Uh, we all have to face problems like this sometimes. Uh, there's no clear path to the solution or it's an unfamiliar domain. You see this in Chopped or in some of those uh, cooking shows where the um, contestant uh, is cooking something they're not familiar with or they're working with an ingredient they're not familiar with. Um, this is a problem I think that a lot of us faced. Certainly I faced, I felt like I faced this problem um, when I last term, uh, maybe even last year, uh, last winter, when uh, a lot of, uh, you know, when we had to do a lot of online instruction. I've done online courses before, uh, but a lot of the technology is different than what I used probably five years ago when I taught online before. Uh, and thinking about the ways in which we can uh, record lectures, uh, update things, that's all different, right? Um, so all of these things uh, are un were unfamiliar to many of us. Uh, so as uh, we became more familiar, the obstacles got smaller. Um, another limitation are cognitive limitations. Uh, so if I'm busy doing something else, it's gonna be harder to solve the problem, uh, right? If I'm trying to solve three problems, uh, it's gonna be harder than solving one problem because my working memory is taxed uh, my attention is going to be drawn in several directions. And from what you remember on uh, um, uh, the attention lectures, when you split your attention or try to divide your attention, there's always going to be some kind of a cost. Uh, so that's going to affect your ability. And that becomes an obstacle. Um, and just in general, if you're confused uh, about the situation, that can also be an obstacle. So how do we remove these obstacles? We uh, employ what are called means. And these are operations to change the original state to move closer to the goal state. Uh, and these might be cognitive operations like solutions from memory, remembering things you did in the past, uh, appropriate allocation of attention, uh, the use of working memory to be able to uh, you know, reason through or talk through uh, some of the ways in which you wanna solve this problem. And of course, they're also going to involve physical operations, being able to move something, uh, being able to cook something over here while you uh, check on the temperature of something over here, right? So there's cognitive things, but also physical things uh, that allow you to remove the obstacle, change the initial, initial state into the goal state. And of course, the goal is what you want to attain, whether it's a good dinner, a good mark in class, uh, or any other example of some kind of a goal that isn't immediately apparent. So there you have it, a problem is an initial state with an obstacle and a goal. Something that's in your way, keeps you from achieving your goal. Uh, things are given to you, uh, whether it's your own abilities or the 
uh, abilities you know, of people around you or the uh, equipment that you have that can make it easier to solve the problem, or things can interfere with your ability to solve the problem, like uh, not being able to access some of the equipment that you needed, right? Uh, or being in an unfamiliar domain. Those things will uh, place some constraints on your ability to solve the problem and make the obstacles uh, seem larger. Uh, you employ different means in order to remove those obstacles and attain the goal. So what we're going to talk about um, in the next few slides, well, first I want to talk about uh, how well defined these problems are, but what we'll talk about after that are what some of these means are. Uh, the problem with problems, of course, is that often they're not represented very well. Uh, so in Guy's Grocery Games or Canadian Bake Off or whatever those shows are, it's pretty well defined, right? Uh, you know what the end state is supposed to be. Uh, if you're watching uh, any of these kinds of reality shows, so if you're watching The Bachelor, for example, right, uh, the goal in a Bachelor show is for the two people or a Bachelorette is for the two people to end up, right, doesn't always happen, but there's lots of obstacles on the way. Problem is, the problem with problems is often with how they are represented. Uh, so I described some clearly well-represented problems, uh, getting a good mark, cooking a good dinner, um, being able to, uh, you know, win at one of the competitive cooking shows or uh, win at the bachelor or bachelorette. Uh, but those are, you know, those are well-defined. There are ill-defined problems. So well-defined problems are those which I just gave an example of. These are things where things are specified. You know where you are now uh, and you know where you want to be, right? So at the beginning of the bachelor, uh, there's an initial state. There's a bachelor and a bunch of uh, contestants, right? At the end of The Bachelor, they're supposed to be two and they're supposed to uh, stay happy, right? Uh, that's the initial state and the goal state. Uh, successfully navigating that uh, would require uh, moving through a series of steps uh, and achieving the goal. Uh, so in a completely specified problem, all of that information is given to you. Uh, other examples would be like multiple choice questions. It's a great example of a well-defined problem. So our exam yesterday uh, was a series of multiple choice questions. Uh, and you know that one of them has to be the answer, right? Uh, you know, as you don't go into a multiple choice question thinking that one of the, that none of the selections could be one unless there is an answer that says none of the above, right? Uh, so you always know there's gonna be an answer. So that's a clearly defined problem. Cooking something from a recipe, especially if it's a well-designed recipe, clearly defined problem. You don't have food, you've got a series of steps, now you do have food, right? Well-defined. Uh, but a lot of problems are not well-defined. Some of the information is missing. Uh, maybe you don't know there's a problem yet, uh, so the initial state is not well-defined. Uh, maybe you don't know the goals, uh, so the goal state is not well-defined. Um, maybe you're lacking some information about some of the means. When these things are missing, uh, when there's no, when you're not given information uh, or you don't know what the goal is, uh, problem solving can be much more difficult. And so one of the things we're gonna talk about, uh, one of the things that Newell and Simon were particularly interested in, uh, and this is covered in the text as well, uh, is changing an ill-defined problem into a well-defined problem. So taking something that's complex and breaking it down into smaller, simpler, more well-defined problems that you can solve with tried and true heuristics and algorithms. So how do people solve problems? We've defined what a problem is. We've talked about how to study it. Uh, let's talk about problem space representations, the, important of different, the importance of problem representation. Uh, and then we'll talk about memory and knowledge. So representation in search. Uh, I suggested that problem solving uh, means moving from an initial state to a goal state, right? So this implies, although I didn't say it uh, earlier, but it implies that you need to represent the problem uh, in your mind, right? So you need to know uh, what this initial state is. Uh, you need to be able to uh, elucidate or describe what the initial state is and to create a mental representation or a mental model of the initial state and a mental model of the goal state. Uh, that allows you to search for a solution. So you represent the problem, uh, and then you can use a series of means uh, to solve this problem. So 
we described what a problem space is earlier in this uh, lecture. We said it's all the possible things you can do to solve or not solve a problem, all of the possible steps that you can take. Uh, I have to confess, I do not watch uh, The Bachelor. I'm only using the example because uh, the show just ended yesterday, and I imagine uh, it's just something that was in the news. I was reading the news this morning and the, the outcome of The Bachelor or whatever. So I don't think I've ever watched a Bachelor show, uh, to be honest with you, but it sort of permeates uh, pop culture anyway, right? So I'm kind of vaguely aware of how the show runs. Um, we've got a Bachelor at the beginning and we've got all the contestants, right? We want him to end up with uh, the right match at the end. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, right? So imagine all of the possible things that could have happened during a series of The Bachelor, this series of The Bachelor, right? Imagine all the things that happened, but then expand that by all the things that potentially could have happened, the entire universe of possible Bachelor events. Right? Imagine each possible pairing, uh, maybe somebody leaves early, maybe somebody doesn't leave early, and imagine all of those scenarios. So some of the contestants leave early. Imagine uh, they didn't leave early, someone else left early. Uh, so imagine he went with on one date and not the other. Imagine all of the possible combinations, some which happened, uh, some which didn't happen, some which are plausible, some which are implausible. So everything that could potentially possibly happen in one season of The Bachelor is the problem space. So if you wanna build an AI to solve The Bachelor, you'd need to know all the possible moves in advance, uh, and then you would pick the series of steps that would lead you to the inevitable conclusion of a successful Bachelor uh, series, right? Uh, and this includes everything that could possibly happen. That is your problem space. So you can imagine the problem space of The Bachelor is huge, right? Because we're dealing with human beings who, you know, reveal more or less about their backgrounds. Uh, we're talking about unexpected things that might happen, expected things that might happen, but you've got to have all of that represented in your problem space. Uh, so no one knows how large the problem space of The Bachelor is. So we don't study problem solving uh, in complex domains or domains as complex as The Bachelor. Uh, we tend to solve, study problem solving in domains like studying how people play chess or studying how people solve word problems or solve mazes, things that are much smaller and more well-contained. So imagine a complex problem like The Bachelor, uh, and then imagine a much simpler version of it uh, where maybe there's only two contestants, right? Then all the possible things that could happen to two contestants. Then imagine it getting even smaller and it's no longer contestants and people, uh, it's really just one person trying to solve a simple puzzle uh, by all the possible moves. That's what a problem space is. It's everything you could do in the all the possible sort of universes uh, that could exist that this problem could exist in, and you need to find the correct selection of things uh, or states in order to move that initial state to the goal state. I never thought I'd use the bachelor as an example, but actually, come to think of it, it's a pretty good example of a complex problem space. Um, so problem space analysis is finding the correct route through this problem space. We're going to talk about the state and we're going to talk about the operators. Um, so let's talk about how you might search. Uh, two broadly defined ways in which you can search through your problem space are uh, an algorithm uh, and, and or heuristics. These ideas are going to come back, by the way, when we talk about reasoning and when we talk about decision making. Uh, cognitive heuristics are things that we do where we use our memory uh, and our familiarity with something in order to try to get a, try to arrive at a solution more quickly or arrive at a decision more quickly. So uh, we take advantage of what we already know about uh, in order to, uh, to maybe make a few short, shortcuts. Um, algorithms are guaranteed solutions. So if you've got a good algorithm, uh, you're guaranteed to find the right answer. So uh, yes, it looks like she wants to get out. I knew, I knew it was going to happen because I have a heuristic, which is that after she jumps off of my uh, lap and heads back that way, I know that she's going to be back in the background. Let me just let the cat out for a minute because um, the door is latched. Um, otherwise, she'll just continue to be a, be a little pest back there. So hold on for a second. OK, 
can't believe I have to deal with this sort of thing. Um, okay, so she'll be back in later for sure. She does need a little cat door. I keep thinking I got to get a little cat door, but you know, in the whole, let's be honest, in the series of possible uh, home repair and maintenance things uh, that I have uh, to do over the, I mean, there's other things that have sort of, that seem higher priority than a little tiny cat door uh, in my home office, um, but I'm thinking it's going to probably move a little bit higher. Uh, so yes, uh, at some point we'll be putting it out. I'll, I'll put in a little cat door. Uh, if I could figure out how to train her just to maybe put a little lever on the door or something so that she can pull down on it, you know, step on it and open it up and then, but then she'll just leave it hanging open. So either way, there's going to, this is a, this is a problem solving uh, exercise. Um, uh, peppermint is an example of problem solving in a very small space. Uh, so we're talking about algorithms. Algorithms are a guaranteed solution. Uh, and we want to talk about, uh, I was talking about The Bachelor again, uh, which again, I don't watch The Bachelor. I don't actually know what happened. Um, but it's, like I said, it's popular. Uh, it's in popular consciousness. Um, maybe possibly other people that live in my household, other members of the family watch The Bachelor uh, and we're talking about it this morning. So um, in, in The Bachelor, we've got all the possible scenarios. So imagine this massive, it's, it's okay to admit you've watched The Bachelor. Uh, you got this massive um, selection of possible uh, states, right? All the possible states of uh, possible Bachelor and contestant matchups, right? Uh, now, if you could do that, if you could sort of quantify every single thing um, into a uh, massive array of possible scenarios, so suppose you could do that, suppose you could consider every possible permutation, uh, including things like contestants, uh, you know, die midway through, or uh, somebody, uh, you know, turns out that uh, they're related uh, in some weird, I mean, all the possible things that could happen, seen and unseen, right? Uh, you could probably come up with a uh, algorithm, uh, a computer search algorithm that would search through all of these possible uh, configurations and then arrive at what would be the best series of steps that the bachelor could take and the contestants could take in order to arrive at the right match, right? That's way too complex for any a uh, person to uh, set up in an artificial intelligence system, but it's it could be done, right? Theoretically, this could be done. That would be your algorithmic uh, approach. You would have everything laid out in front, and then you would consider all of these possibilities until you arrived at the right solution. And that's how early uh, computer chess programs worked. Uh, all of the possible moves were evaluated, and then the move that was chosen, which was the one which was uh, most likely uh, to uh, result in, uh, in an eventual win. Um, algorithms are great for computers, especially if they're fast computers and fast algorithms wa uh, working in, uh, uh, in parallel. They're not so good for most of us because we don't have time to work through all of those things. So what we have to use are some general rules and guidelines. Uh, we need better searching and we need to rely on solutions for, for memory. So algorithmic solutions are guaranteed. Um, math formulas or recipes are examples of algorithms that we do use. Um, an example of an algorithm that you might use in solving a problem would be an exhaustive search. Uh, that means you consider every possible solution uh, or step uh, in solution. Now for a problem like The Bachelor, it's way too big. There's too many possible uh, variables going on, too many possible, uh, you know, too many possible different states of play. Um, but in other cases, it might not be so bad. So suppose you were looking for something, suppose, uh, you know, this is something that used to happen when uh, my kids were much younger. Uh, so when they were like in uh, elementary school, grade one or kindergarten or something like that, or even younger, uh, maybe they lost their, uh, you know, lost a toy or later on lost, you know, an uh, air, you know, air, what do they call them? iPods. That was the old iPod touch things that think kids used to have. Maybe some of you had those back when you were younger, uh, before you were allowed to have a phone, right? You get an iPod touch, right? So you lose that maybe, or you lose your Nintendo DS or something like that. Um, and your parents might say, well, where did you, where did you leave it last? And then you say, well, I left, I last saw it in my room. So one way in which you could employ an exhaustive search algorithm would be to search every possible location in your room. If you knew it was in your room for sure, 
uh, this would actually be a good solution, right? Uh, you would search every possible location, every square inch of your room until you find uh, the thing that was missing. And if you didn't find it, you would then be able to know that it wasn't uh, in your room. Now, notice, of course, that if you were to do, so imagine doing something like that, you lost where you, you, know, you lost your phone or you lost your AirPods or something like that. Um, you don't just look everywhere, right? You probably look in places where you think it's likely to be based on where you probably put things, right? So if I lose my keys or my sunglasses, I'm not going to look every location of the house. I'm going to start in places where I think it probably is, right? I'm going to start looking, uh, you know, on the table near the door or start looking, uh, you know, on the on my desk or something like that. So there are going to be places where you look first. So you're already, even if you're planning to use an exhaustive search algorithm, you're already starting to use some kind of heuristic, which means you're using your knowledge uh, to make the solution happen more quickly. So these exhaustive search algorithms can be used when the problem space is small, but for things like chess, for example, uh, where maybe you have 20 possible opening moves and then there's 400 possible moves from that, then 7.5 million, then 225 million moves. That's only four steps into a chess game. There are lots of possible moves. Most of them are bad, right? Uh, and for a problem space like The Bachelor, which is even uh, much more complex than a chess game, uh, there are, you know, the exhaustive search would not be a, an appropriate solution. So we use heuristics. Uh, we use our knowledge, uh, which is, we're going to call this a cognitive shortcut. And by shortcut, I just mean that we're going to shortcut the process of looking at all of the possible steps in the problem space by looking at the steps that we think are most likely to lead us to a solution based on our past experience. So even in the simplified example of looking uh, for your lost AirPods, so if I lose my AirPods, uh, which doesn't happen often, but occasionally I don't remember where I put them. Uh, I don't look everywhere in the house for them. I look by my bedside, or I look on the desk, or I look uh, in the pocket of the coat that I wore, or something like that, right? There are going to be places where I look first, because that's where I think I left them, right? Those are the kind of places where I think they are going to be. So instead of a recipe, for example, uh, if you're cooking, uh, you might use general knowledge about what and where things are. Uh, so uh, if you're cooking from experience, you might kind of know what things taste like or know what things are. Um, so let's talk about some of these uh, simple search heuristics. Um, we've got hill climbing and means and analysis. Uh, hill climbing is the simplest possible search heur heuristic, which is almost algorithmic uh, in uh, character. And means end analysis is a way to uh, break a problem up into smaller pieces. Both of these are what are known as simple search heuristics. So these are supposed to be, these are what Newell and Simon discovered that people do when they don't have experience solving the problem. Uh, so looking for my AirPods, for example, I have experience solving this problem, right? So I got a lot of knowledge around this complex domain. I know where I leave things and I use that memory. But suppose you're facing a new problem you've never solved before, um, but you also don't wanna go through all of the possible solutions. What are some of the ways in which you can narrow the solution set uh, effectively so that you can still solve the problem? And that's what these are. These are simple general problem solving heuristics rather than the kind of heuristics that you and I might use when we're trying to solve something uh, that we're familiar with. So these are the kind of things that you would use when you're completely unfamiliar with solving something. Hill climbing is a simple search heuristic, almost algorithmic, uh, but the idea is rather than considering all of the possible steps, you only take a step when the current state, uh, you only take a step when you can make the current state closer to the goal state or the end state. So you don't do anything unless it's going to help advance your position, right? So you don't move somewhere unless it gets you closer to where you want to be. And that's why it's called hill climbing. So you can imagine if you were building a simple way, simple algorithm or a simple heuristic uh, to climb a hill, uh, the, the exhaustive search algorithm would mean consider every possible step that you can take, both up and down, sideways, and so on. Uh, 
and then add them up and figure out which series of steps uh, gets you to the top of the hill. That's going to consider a lot of different steps that are not going to really matter. Uh, what matters is just getting to the top of the hill. So if you constrain your search for steps that will only move you up, you'll be able to climb the hill uh, without considering all of these steps that would take you back down. Um, and this relies to some degree on similarity because you take, now what do you want? Uh, what do you rely on similarity? Um, okay, so uh, it relies on similarity, taking uh, your assessment of the initial state, the current state, and seeing how similar they can be. Hill climbing uh, involves incremental steps. So each step, step is gonna take you closer to your goal like climbing a hill. Um, it often finds solutions in cases where it's a relatively small uh, problem space, but a problem space that has few constraints. So if the obstacle is straightforward, uh, if the obstacle is clear, uh, and if the obstacle can be removed uh, with a series of incremental steps, then this is a really good way to solve problems you're not familiar with. Um, but it also has a lot of problems. It's not always uh, appropriate. Uh, and it runs into some particular issues known as local minima or local maxima. And I'll show what this means on the next slide. So imagine we want to build a hill climbing robot. Uh, so we're, you know, we're building something that's going to uh, work on Mars, right? So we've got, uh, what is it? Perseverance is currently on Mars. And Mars has a lot of hills, right? Because you've got, uh, you know, big flat deserts and you've got, uh, you know, mountains and ravines and canyons from when there used to be water on Mars and all sorts of complex stuff. Uh, one of the things we want to do is to make sure our rover or our robot can get to the top of the hill to get a good view of something, right? Uh, so one way to, the simplest way to solve the problem, simplest way to program this robot to climb to the top of the hill uh, is to only take steps when it's going to uh, increase its altitude, right? So suppose we built this robot so that it would not move unless a step would take it up. So it's got to go up, right? Each step has to take it up. That's great. That's going to get you to the top of the peak. An example of a local maxima would be a case like this, where the robot climbs to the top of this hill, uh, and then it realizes that any step it's going to take is going to take it back down. Uh, in this case, this simple robot thinks it's at the top of the hill right? Because there's no step it can take in any direction, which is going to increase its height, increase its altitude. But the peak it wants to get to is actually here. If the only thing this robot can do is get to the top of a peak by uh, increasing its altitude, it's going to fail, right? So it's going to re reach this local high point, uh, which seems like a peak, but it's not actually the peak. So hill climbing works, but it doesn't work if you can sort of if you end up backing yourself into a corner or coming to what seems like a solution, and then you've got to work backwards again. Uh, so maybe this robot has to go back down the hill uh, and go up this way, or go back down this hill and come up this way. So there might be multiple ways in which you can solve the problem, but they all involve working backwards from this uh, eventual goal of being at the top. And you probably all know problems like this where, um, you start to solve something, uh, you start to do something, and then you realize you got too far on the wrong path. Uh, and in order to finish solving the problem, you have to undo some of what you did. Uh, and in order to, you know, you, then you feel bad. You think like, well, I already did this. Now I just have to undo what I did. I need to start over again. If any of you have ever done computer programming, sometimes that's, it works a lot like that, right? You've got to uh, work ahead and then you realize you did the wrong thing. So you got to go back. Uh, writing a paper uh, or writing a chapter or a book can be like that, where you uh, work ahead on some things and then you realize you were going down the wrong path and you've got to work backwards uh, and then you made a mistake. Uh, so solving a problem by hill climbing sometimes means uh, you feel like you've made a mistake and you've got to work backwards in order to uh, succeed. So how do we do that? How do we work backwards? Well, one way in which we can work backwards is to think about sub goals. So we can break this bigger problem up into smaller sub-goals. The sub-goals might be able to be solved by these simple algorithms. And we call this means-end analysis. Means-end analysis is a, um, it's a phrase that was coined by Newell and Simon. 
And it talks about a reduction of the problem space. So taking a very complex problem and breaking it up into smaller, more easily solvable problems. Uh, so breaking an ill-defined problem up into several small, well-defined problems, like let's take an example of cooking a meal, right? Uh, so if you've ever had to cook a large holiday meal for some kind of uh, family holiday, right? That often involves several days of planning. Uh, it involves a lot of different ingredients. Maybe it involves cooking things you don't cook on a regular basis. That's why it's a holiday meal, right? It's something celebratory. Uh, lots of different things, bigger portions and uh, sizes of things than you're used to cooking because you've got guests coming over. Um, so most of us probably do. Uh, is we break it up into sub goals. We you know, have shopping uh, sub goals. We've got ingredient preparation sub goals. We cut things up into small pieces. Uh, we do prep work for uh, cutting up vegetables, prep work for maybe marinating different kinds of meats or things uh, like that. Uh, starting to cook things ahead of time in certain ways. Maybe there's some pre-cooking that can be done. All of this is a way to solve the problem by breaking up a big problem into smaller problems. So what does this look like? So in a, in a meal preparation, uh, holiday meal preparation, it's a big complex affair, but it's also something that most of us have experience with. And even if we don't have experience directly, we've been participants in that kind of thing, right? Maybe we haven't cooked a large holiday meal, but uh, we've been over to a grandparents' house or relative's house when that's been done, right? So maybe we've helped out and there's usually a lot of shared knowledge. Some people are experts at it. Uh, maybe the person who always hosts the meal uh, is really good at doing it. Uh, so you see that there's a lot of uh, knowledge and expertise, but how would you solve this if you didn't have knowledge and expertise? So one of the examples, this is talked about in the textbook, and I'll go through each step here, um, is what's known as the tower problem, sometimes called the Tower of Hanoi problem, sometimes called the peg uh, and disc tower problem, but they're all sort of the same problem. And what you have is a series of wooden pegs so imagine this is a physical game that you had. You probably had something like this. Uh, you could see, you know, when you were like a, you probably had something like this when you were a toddler, right? This is like a little uh, game. This is like the first puzzle game you might get when you're uh, two or something like that, because it's uh, easy to manipulate, right? So you've got these wooden pegs, one, two, and three, and then you've got discs, and each disc fits over top of a peg, uh, and you've got a big disc, a middle disc, and a small disc. Uh, and they stack up like a tower. This is the initial state. You've got the tower built on the left-hand side. Uh, and this can be built with more than three, but we're just going to use the three-disc uh, tower to simplify things. So we have three discs uh, built into a tower. And you'll notice the bigger one is always at the bottom. Uh, and we want to get it to the end state, or the goal state, right? So the goal state in this case is uh, the large disc medium disc, small disc on the rightmost peg. So we just want to move the tower from the leftmost peg to the rightmost peg, but there are two givens here uh, that place some constraints on your ability to solve this uh, in the most obvious way, which would be to pick all the discs up and just slide them right over there. Uh, number one uh, is that you can only move one disc at a time, right? So you can't move the entire tower at once. You've got to move only one component of the tower. Second constraint uh, is that you can never have a larger disc on top of a smaller disc, right? They always have to have the bottom ones. So how would you solve this? Um, so let's look at this initial state, intermediate state, and goal state uh, for this Tower of Hanoi problem. Uh, there are a couple of constraints, right? So you can't have the big, uh, you can't have a larger disc on top of a smaller disc, and you can only move one disc at a time. Uh, so let's think about what some of the sub goals are going to be. Uh, what would be the first sub goal that you would want to accomplish? So when you're solving this, what's the first sub goal that you want to accomplish? If anybody wants to answer in chat, I would pretend like I'm raising your hand. So you got to move disk A, right? The first disk uh, and move disk A accomplishes, well, let's say we want to move it here. Um, moving disk A is a means to accomplish an end for one of the sub goals. So one of the sub goals we need to accomplish is uh, we need to be able to build the tower. Well, so the main goal is we need to be able to build the tower on the rightmost peg. But one of the sub goals of that is that we need to be able to get the 
biggest disc over to the rightmost peg, right? That's a sub goal. So we need to have a foundation. In order to accomplish that sub goal, we need to break that goal into even smaller sub goals because one of the things we need to do to accomplish that sub goal is we need to clear off the smaller ones. Uh, so what would be my next step would be to clear off that uh, larger disc. So now at least we've accomplished sub goal number one. We've made it possible to move the big disc. What would be my next step here? So what's my, uh, what's another sub goal that I need to uh, try to solve here? So I've got, I got to, that's right. I got to free up the right peg. I can move disc A into the middle peg. So you've got them both there. So, uh, and that's, I, I'm glad you answered it in that way because one of you answered with the means and one of you answered with the end, which is why it's called means end analysis. At each step, we think about what the end is and what means we need to get there. Uh, so the sub goal is to free up the right peg. Uh, so we got to free up the right peg and we do that by what Lauren mentioned. Um, and uh, that is to move disc A uh, into the middle peg. So now we've accomplished the second of our sub goals. We've freed up uh, disc, we freed up the third peg. And that even wasn't a sub goal until we made it a sub goal, right? We kind of created that problem by uh, having to solve the first sub goal, which was to clear off uh, the space for that foundation disc, which we can then move over there. Uh, and then the rest of it falls into place. Uh, so means end analysis involves looking at every, uh, at every opportunity to break a goal up into sub goals. And that's the end. Uh, and then you look at which means you can take to accomplish that end. If you can't accomplish the end with a series of means, then you may need to break that up into smaller sub goals. The tower problem is an example of a very simple, straightforward problem. Uh, problem that is best solved or most solved by people uh, with means and analysis. Now, of course, we could use an exhaustive search, right? We could consider all of the possible moves and then select the moves that would allow us to arrive at this. But most of the moves would be the wrong ones, right? Most of the moves would be moves that are not allowed, <laughs> uh, or most of the moves would be moves that wouldn't allow us to solve the problem. And then you'd be asking, you'd search through all of those moves uh, and you would uh, navigate through. So that approach to navigating through problem space is inefficient. A more efficient way to get through problem space is to break things up into small problem spaces that you can solve with one or two steps. Um, let's look at a more complex version of this. Uh, and we'll go through this one in a little bit more detail. Um, this is what's known as the Hobbits and Orcs problem. And this, there's lots of different versions of this, but the most well-known is the one that's called Hobbits and Orcs. Uh, now this was um, probably, this was you know, several decades old, right? So this predates uh, the Lord of the Rings movie. Uh, and it probably would have been popular around the time that uh, Tolkien's books were popular in the 1960s um, or maybe in the 1970s. So people would have you know, still been thinking about Hobbits and Orcs. Uh, well before uh, the Lord of the Rings movie. Um, so here it is. Uh, three hobbits and three orcs arrive at a riverbank, uh, and they all wish to cross to the other side. Now, set aside, by the way, the fact that, uh, you know, in the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit, uh, they're, they're not going to be working together. Let's just imagine that they're working together. Um, but they're also antagonistic. So they're not really friends, but right now they're working towards a common goal. So they all want to get to the other side. That's their common goal. Fortunately, there is a boat, but unfortunately, the boat can only hold two creatures at one time. So it's a small boat. Um, also, there is another problem, and you should recognize these problems as givens that place constraints uh, and introduce the obstacle. Um, there's another problem. Uh, orcs are vicious, and whenever there are more orcs than hobbits on one side of the river, the orcs will immediately attack the hobbits. So what this means is that this places some serious constraints on the way in which you need to solve this problem. Uh, and this also should be an indication that there are going to be a lot of possible uh, false uh, moves, right? Because anytime there are more orcs than hobbits, the game is over. So we need to avoid going down the path that would uh, result in more orcs than hobbits. 
but we still need to be able to solve the problem of getting everybody over. Note uh, that orcs, though vicious, can be trusted to bring the boat back across the river. Uh, so how should the problem of ferrying everyone across the river be solved? Um, so here is an example of the representation. So you've got this on your slide, and then your next slide is the whole solution set. But let's work through it uh, step by step, because I want to highlight a couple of places where when people are solving this problem, they traditionally have difficulty. Um, in some of the work that uh, I don't have these slides up, but in the textbook, Anderson talks about how you would see increased engagement with prefrontal regions of the brain when people are faced with these kinds of complex problems that they have to uh, work backward from. So initial state is on the left. We've got three, or three hobbits, three orcs, the H's and the O's. Uh, we got the riverbank and the riverbank and the river in the middle, and we want to get them all to the other side, right? So how are we going to do that? Here's my representation, and there's the boat in the middle. So there's our river, there's our boats, uh, there's some hobbits, and there's some orcs. So we can start in any one of a number of ways, but I'm going to suggest that we take one of each. Why? Uh, we got to take one of each so that we don't upset the balance, right? If we took two hobbits, uh, we would uh, then have too many orcs. Uh, if we took two orcs, that would work temporarily, um, but then we would end up in a situation where we had uh, too many orcs. So we're going to take one of each. Um, we've got to be able to leave one here, but one has to go back, right? And that's the critical thing. So which one should I leave? Any suggestions? I should definitely leave the orc. So I, they both get off balance. Um, I leave the orc and the hobbit goes back, right? So the hobbit goes back, why? Because we wanna make sure that we uh, maintain uh, some sort of uh, state of balance. So now we want to, hobbit jumps out, two orcs jump in. We still got balance, right? We got three hobbits, two orcs, we're okay. Um, now we've got both going over, right? Uh, both go over here and they jump out. Now we're in a state uh, where we're halfway solved with the problem, right? We got half of our characters over to the right side of the river uh, and uh, we should be able to solve this pretty quickly. So who goes next? What's the next step that should happen? Well, I have to bring an orc back, right? Um, one orc brings the boat back because that's all that's there. Uh, and now what should we do? So who should go over now? What would be the next best stage? Anybody want to hazard a guess here? Two hobbits then leave the orc. That's exactly right. So we've got a orc hops out, um, two hobbits go in, they go over, we're balance is still here. Uh, and now what's my next move? My next move here should be, uh, we got one of each. Uh, they both go back. And the reason I want to send both of them back is to maintain the balance, right? So they both get out. Uh, and then we take two hobbits over. Uh, this is important because it maintains the balance again. Uh, and now we're going to send the orc back uh, in order to maintain the balance. And what has happened is this is exactly where people have problems. There's a couple of places where we've got some issues. Uh, one is... Uh, We'll go back here. We've half solved the problem, right? Um, but we've got to work backwards. Now we basically have to bring all of the hobbits and orcs back, or all the orcs back rather. Uh, they exchange places. Uh, he goes back and we've now completely switched. We haven't gotten any closer to solving the problem from a global sense. Uh, but what we've done is we've broken the problem up into smaller uh, pieces. I mean, we know the final goal is to get all six over. And in order to get halfway there, uh, we need to get a balanced number over. And one way to do that is to realize that there's a, there's a second problem that we need to solve. And that second problem we need to solve is we can't let the orcs outnumber, right? If the orcs ever outnumber, the problem is, you know, the problem's over, right? We just, we've lost the game, right? We haven't solved the problem. So in order to keep that in mind, 
uh, we need to come up with sub goals that always keep that additional problem in mind, uh, which is we have to keep moving the orcs out of the way. Uh, we kind of saw a version of that uh, in the tower problem. And by the way, now it's pretty simple because now we just move them both over. Uh, so there are two places where people would normally have problems uh, or difficulty with a problem like this uh, would be those cases where it seems like you're undoing something you've already done. Uh, and in this case, you're undoing, uh, you're, you just took the orcs over and now you take them right back, right? Uh, and they get out of the boat and then you start taking hobbits back over. Um, and so you end up with, these are the uh, steps that we have there. So um, you end up in these cases where you've got to work backwards. We bring orcs back onto one side and then we have to bring them back and exchange them. So the orcs have gone back and forth. Uh, and the reason they go back and forth uh, is we need to keep solving that problem. We're moving them out of the way. With the tower problem, that was one of the problems we had. We had to keep moving the little disks out of the way in order to move the big disk over, right? So it's still the same sort of an analogous problem, just a little bit more complex because we've got more uh, pieces uh, to move back and forth. But the idea is the same, right? In order to uh, build the tower on the right-hand side, you need to free up, uh, you need to move things away from the big disk. Uh, then you've got to move the little ones out of the way, and then you've got to move the big disc over here. Uh, so those little discs were kind of like the orcs, right? We had to keep moving them out of the way uh, in order to solve the problem. Once we get everybody over there, we can uh, then just move the orcs back over. Uh, so they kind of work like this little disc. Now, uh, it's unlikely that most people would uh, notice the analogies between those two, uh, but may, maybe some of you did. Uh, I want to talk about that in a little bit, uh, whether or not people use knowledge to solve problems via analogy. Um, so the Hobbit and Orc is an example of a means end analysis. I don't think you have these slides in here. This was just to remind me to say these things because I didn't have anything written on the Hobbits and Orcs problem solving page that used the word means end analysis. We had talked about it with the tower problem, but I just wanted to make sure I didn't forget. So. Um, you don't have these slides, but this is just a reminder to me. I've already said this. Uh, the main goal of moving all six can be divided into sub goals. The sub goals, and what are some of those sub goals? The sub goals are, well, in order to move all six, we have to move some of them. And in order to move some of them, we need to respect uh, the balance. And in order to respect the balance, that means we've got the sub goal of moving the orcs out of the way. First thing we have to do is move them out of the way here so that we can clear up space for the hobbits to move. Then we slowly exchange them. That's another sub goal. Uh, then we can move them back. So we're accomplishing these sub goals with smaller means. Um, so I want to talk about two additional kinds of problems. Uh, one of them involves this sort of insight uh, or moving outside of the obvious constraints. Uh, you've probably seen this because this is a common uh, problem that we that would be talked about in um, a common problem that we talked about in Psych 1000. Uh, but in in both of these cases, in this example and in the one I'm going to show you, uh, prior knowledge would help. So the more times in which you've solved problems that are analogously similar, not similar on the surface, but similar underneath the more likely you are to be able to solve the problem. So let's talk about Dunker's candle problem, which is an example of insight problem solving. Uh, then we're gonna talk about something called the laser and tumor problem, which is an example of an insight problem uh, that can also be solved by analogy. And I think that's the final uh, slide. So actually we're doing great on time, this is terrific. Okay, so you've probably seen this before. Uh, subjects were originally presented, this was done originally uh, by Carl Dunker in, I think he's a, a German uh, Gestalt psychologist. So this would have been done uh, like in the 1920s or 1930s. Um, and he was really interested in problem solving. Uh, Anderson talks a little bit about this, also talks about some problems where uh, you're trying to tie some strings together, very similar types of problems. Um, and likely if you solved one of them, you'd be able to solve others because you realize the solution is to use things in ways that they're not supposed to normally be used. And this is a great example of what's known as functional fixedness. 
functional fixedness means that sometimes when you see an object, it is framed uh, by how it's presented. So if it's given to you in a certain way, its function might be fixed. So in Dunker's candle problem, you get some candles and you get some matches and some tacks and some other things. And you're told that you need to mount the candle uh, somehow so that it can light the room, right? So you've got to mount it on the wall so it can light the room. Uh, and you've got two conditions. In one condition, uh, you get the candles, you get some tacks and some matches and some empty boxes, right? So you get all the things you need. In another condition, which we're going to call the functional fixed condition, uh, the boxes contain the candles, matches, or tacks, uh, depending on which version you do. What's fixed about that is that when you see a box of matches, it's a box of matches, right? It's not an empty box. It's a box that holds the matches. If you see a box with candles in it, it's not an empty box, it's a box with candles. So its function is being fixed by the presentation. And so what you would see uh, in a functional fixed condition, this would be one example of it, um, is that you would have the matches in a box. Uh, here's your matches, here's some extra stuff, the string, which isn't usable, uh, some tacks, and here's some candles. Uh, and what Dunker found, and lots of other sub, uh, psychologists have found, is that when you're given this function fixed condition, when the box, in this case, is being used to hold something at the beginning in the initial state, uh, that's a given. And that given constrains how that box can be used. In this case, the box is being fixed as a way to hold matches. Uh, the solution that Dunker was hoping his subjects would arrive at, and what most of his control subjects arrived at, was to tack the box to the wall uh, and then mount the candle on the box so that the box could act as a little shelf. By the way, don't ever do this. Look how close they are. There's absolutely no way this would be, I mean, this is going to burn your house down, right? I mean, no one in their right mind would put a candle this close to the uh, wall. I don't know what Dunker was thinking, but this is extremely unsafe. Uh, just looking at this makes me nervous. Um, you can tell by looking at it, this is that cheap artificial um, fake pine <laughs> paneling that you would find in like uh, a 1960s basement or something. We used to have this in my bedroom, paneling like this when, when I was a kid. Uh, if I put a candle next to it, it would probably burst into flames. I mean, this is absolutely terrible to look at. But anyway, this is what uh, Dunker wanted his uh, subjects to arrive at, was to use the box as a shelf. That's all he wanted to find out if they could do. And he found out that most of them could do it when they weren't given the solution, but they couldn't do it for when, when the box wasn't holding something, but they couldn't do it when the box was holding something. And so he concluded that when the function of something is fixed, people have difficulty incorporating it uh, into their problem solving uh, system. Now, I mentioned that suppose you had solved this problem, and then you were asked to solve one of the other Dunker problems. Uh, one of the other problems that Anderson talks about is being able to tie two ropes together that don't reach, right? So you've got one rope and another rope, and you can't reach, but you know they will reach, but they're too high for you to reach. Um, you reach one, and then you can't grab the other one. So one solution was uh, to tie something like a pair of pliers so that you can get one swinging so you can hold one and then grab the other one and tie them together. That's another example of function fixed. Um, the pliers in this case, or the hammer or whatever tool it was, uh, it was fixed as being a tool, but if you can use it in some other way, like a pendulum, uh, then you're not, then you're able to solve the problem. And what I'm suggesting is that if people solve one of these problems, they're more likely to solve others in a similar way because there's a deep structure similarity. There's a deep analogical similarity here. Matches, candles are not similar at all on the surface to ropes and pliers. But if you realize that the analogy is that you need to use an object in a way that it's not traditionally used for some kind of novel use, then you might be able to start looking at the objects for in alternative ways. And my guess is that you would solve these problems more readily. Uh, that's something um, that was examined uh, in some research uh, by Jick and Holyoke, uh, where they looked at the role of relevant knowledge and analogy. Now, Anderson in his chapter uh, talks about uh, the importance of analogy in problem solving. And he talks about how we use analogies. Uh, so uh, he talks about how we might imagine that an, the structure of an atom is like the solar system, 
right? So that you've got something at the center and then a force that allows things to, um, you know, orbit around it and so on. So he gives some good examples and you should definitely read that because I'll probably ask questions about them uh, on the exam. But I want to talk about how uh, analogies are used in problem solving. So here's a problem that it turns out people have difficulty solving. Um, a patient has an in, this is known as a laser and tumor problem. Uh, a patient has an inoperable tumor. So inoperable here means that you cannot operate on it. Uh, that's what inoperable means. So you can't operate it on it. But uh, a doctor can use lasers to destroy the tumor. So uh, that's one way in which you can destroy it. Uh, the problem is that at the intensity needed to destroy the tumor, the lasers would dis destroy good tissue as well, right? So however powerful the laser needs to be, the lasers need to be in order to destroy the tumor, uh, they would cut through uh, good tissue. We can't have that, right? So how can the doctor destroy the tumor without destroying any good tissue? Uh, does anyone have any, well, you probably have the solution on your slides, but does anyone have any suggestions for how we might solve this problem? How can you destroy the tumor with the lasers without destroying any of the good tissue at all? Anyone wanna take a guess uh, in the chat window? Yes, a bunch of weaker lasers uh, from different directions. Uh, exactly. So we want to be able, so if anyone hasn't um, thought about this, let's look at the, uh, let's look at the analogy. Uh, but the solution is going to be something like this, uh, right? Where you have the tumor, you get some lasers that are low intensity, they're not going to damage anything. Uh, but when they meet, they sum at that intersection uh, to be strong enough to destroy the good to destroy the tumor, right? So weaker lasers from different directions will solve the problem. And that's what uh, the solution they were looking for. Um, it turns out that a lot of people when first presented with this in a problem solving scenario uh, had difficulty arriving at that solution. And people would, uh, subjects would say things like, uh, you know, can you cut down a little bit or uh, maybe pulse? Uh, so there are a lot of different ways in which people try to solve it, but when first presented, many subjects were unable to solve this problem. Uh, in the experiment I want to tell you about, um, subjects were then, uh, in some cases, some subjects were given a prior story. Before they were given the problem of the laser and tumors, they were told this story about the uh, strong fortress and the dictator. Uh, and I won't read through all of it, but let's look, let's highlight some of it. Uh, there's a small country from a, uh, ruled from a strong fortress by a dictator situated in the middle of the country, surrounded by farms and villages. Lots of roads lead to the countryside and a general wanted to capture the fortress. General knew that an attack by his entire army would capture it. So he's got enough forces. Um, he gathered his army ready to launch a full scale direct attack. He's got the big army there, fortress is over here. And then he learns that the dictator planted mines on the roads. And they were set so that small bodies of men could pass over them safely. And here, I didn't write this, but I should just point out that small bodies of men means a small group, not small men, right? So we're not talking uh, little men, we're talking just a small group. So a small collection of the army could pass over them safely because the dictator obviously needed to move his troops. Um, any large force would detonate the mines, which would blow up the road, damage uh, the, the large force, but also destroy villages. Um, and so the general thought that maybe it would be impossible because he wouldn't be able to move his entire force. If he tried to move his army over any one of the roads, it would detonate these mines. But he devised a plan. He divided his army up into smaller groups, dispatched each group at the head of a different road. Uh, and when he was ready, they gave the signal and they marched. Uh, small enough groups that they're not going to set off the mines. Um, and they continue down the road so that they all arrive together at the fortress at the same time. So they start from different directions. They arrive at the fortress in the middle at the same time, and he captured it. Uh, so what Jick and Holyoke found, so again, like this, what Jick and Holyoke found is when they presented subjects with this tumor problem, um, only about 10% were able to solve it initially. Uh, 
but some subjects read the story of the general first. And some of them too were told that it was a hint. Uh, and what they found is that when they were told it was a hint, most of the subjects were able to solve the tumor problem really quickly. Um, when they weren't told that it was a hint, more of them were able to solve it, but not quite as many. Uh, when there was no hint at all, and when there was no general story, only 10% were able to solve this problem. Uh, and what they concluded was that sub, most people can appreciate this underlying deep structure. So we talked about the tower problem and the orcs problem. Uh, if you had solved one of them, and then we talked about how you could use the solution of one of them to give you a hint for how to solve the other, uh, maybe you would realize that one of the ways to solve the problem is to keep something out of the way, to keep moving something, to keep it out of the way. That was true for the laser, or that was true for the tower problem. That's also true for the hobbits and orcs problem. In this case, if you're told that the general and fortress problem uh, is an analogy and can contain a hint, you would recognize that underlying analogy or analogical similarity uh, that would let you use that information to help you solve it later on. Okay, this is my final slide. Um, so problem solving is a cognitive skill involving representations. So thinking about how to set the problem up uh, and complex thinking. Uh, usually it involves specifying the components, uh, finding the operators. Sometimes it just involves using your memory. So when you use heuristics, you use your memory. Uh, when you use analogy, you're using your memory. Uh, some problems are easy to solve. Some problems are uh, much more complicated. I think this is my final slide. And this is exactly, so we've been going for an hour and a half, which seems like just the right amount of time. Uh, to be honest, if I sort of keep this in mind, um, I can stop my share here. Uh, that's exactly how I should probably do about an hour and a half. Uh, you've got lots of information in the textbook that you can uh, fill this in. Um, are there any questions on this before we go on? Or any questions about anything uh, before we go on, uh, before I shut down the lecture uh, for today? I should have this up and available uh, online uh, sometime this afternoon. Most of the other stuff is there. If there's nothing else, uh, midterm marks should be available soon. Um, there is a makeup exam coming, so I might wait until the makeup exam is uh, present before I post everything. Uh, so you should be able to have your midterm exams probably uh, by the end of this week uh, or very beginning at the absolute latest. Uh, so I do have a few students taking a makeup exam. Uh, I do want to make sure that those are in at the same time so that everyone just sort of gets their mark at the same time. Um, any other questions? All right, enjoy the week. We've only got a few more uh, classes left uh, and then we will be heading into that April exam period. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, message to everyone, I know tomorrow's St. Patrick's Day, traditionally supposed to be a day to have fun. Uh, just, I don't know, I guess wear your mask or something if you're gonna be uh, doing, uh, or you know, maybe a very small uh, gathering or whatever. Uh, just try to be safe as much as possible. Um, I know it's normally a, a funner time, but uh, we've got to hopefully get through just a little bit more before we can start enjoying the summer. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week, and I will see you back here next week. Take care.